So um, then yesterday I was presenting again, and the fire alarm went off. <laughs> so we'll see what happens today, guys. <laughs> so today we're having a debate uh, whether evidence-based librarianship, or sorry, evidence-based library and information practice, is it clear, simple, and wrong? So that's the question that we're going to ask. Too many things to hold on to here. So our presenters today, or our debaters, I should say, are T. Scott Kuchak and Andrew Booth. And it's my great pleasure to introduce both of them to you. Uh, Scott will be our first speaker, and he is the director of Lister Hill Library of the Hill Sciences at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. From 1999 through 2005, he was the editor of the Journal of the Medical Library Association, and he currently serves on the board of directors of the Medical Library Association. He's a frequent guest speaker on topics ranging from intellectual property to scholarly communication to the future of librarianship. And he leads, of course, the international librarian rock band that we heard last night, the Beardy Pigs. Yay. <laughs> and his opponent is Andrew Booth. And Andrew is an information professional slash lecturer slash researcher with experience on a wide, wide range of topics and aspects of evidence-based librarianship, evidence-based practice. His 15 years of experience as a health information professional has included the King's Fund Center, where he managed three national information services. And since November 1994, he's been at the School of Health and Related Research at the University of Sheffield, where he's the Director of Information Resources. His current brief is to develop an information resource to support evidence-based health care, both within the University of Sheffield and the Trent region. Please welcome Andrew. So here's our resolution. The big questions that face our profession cannot be structured in such a way as to meet the test of evidence-based library and information practice. So arguing for this resolution is Scott. And what we're going to do today is Scott will have about 20 minutes to make his case. And then we're going to turn it over to Andrew, who's going to argue against. And he'll have 20 minutes. I'll give them each about five minutes for rebuttals, and then we'll open it up to you um, to ask questions or comments, give your opinions on this issue, and then we'll have some closing comments from the speakers, the debaters, and then we'll perhaps take a vote and see who wins the day. So I'll turn it now over to Scott. Good morning. Um, this is uh, the point where um, typically the speaker expresses their uh, gratitude and sense of honor at being asked to participate in the event. And I'm uh, actually sitting here thinking that the uh, decision to debate, of all people, Andrew Booth on the topic of evidence-based practice in this particular venue is possibly not the brightest decision I've ever made. <laughs> um, so we'll see what happens here. Um, and I would like to just uh, uh, in reinforce what Denise said. I think it will the morning will be more engaging if you all do participate when we get through our initial um, presentation. So I'm hoping that uh, as you are all thinking about these issues, you will uh, also offer your thoughts and ideas and opinions when we get to that portion of the program. Um, I am by nature a skeptic. and. Well, I think I've learned a lot in the last couple of days. Um, I am not in any way, shape, or form part of the evidence-based library and information practice movement, 
such as it is. Um, not that I am uh, unalterably opposed, um, but I do try to approach the questions as I do almost everything with a high degree of um, questioning as to what is actually being talked about and presented. And what I would like to do today is to offer some of the thoughts that that skepticism has led me to, um, after which uh, Andrew will be able to completely demolish um, everything that I have to say. Um, I have, of course, learned tremendously from Andrew, and I relied quite a bit on the handbook as I was getting ready to, uh, to uh, do this presentation. Um, and it's, it's a great book. I certainly don't have to promote it to this crowd. Um, I would imagine that all of you have spent many happy hours with it, um, as have I over the, over the last few weeks. Um, and and there's, there's great stuff in there and clearly makes a major contribution to our thinking about information practice. But I couldn't help thinking as I was reading it that I had a similar reaction to what I had when I first um, came across evidence-based medicine some years ago. And I thought I must be missing something um, because it seemed to me that what they were talking about was the notion that you should be basing therapeutic decisions on what had been shown to work. And as a potential patient, the thought that that was not how medicine was being practiced or that that notion should be somehow controversial and debatable, I found to be somewhat troubling. Um, I have since come to realize, of course, that, that the rubric evidence-based medicine does encompass a particular way of looking at evidence and using evidence. And that is certainly a worthwhile endeavor and possibly has led to some improved um, medical decisions. But I think the question becomes how far can you take that kind of a notion and apply it in other domains. So when we're talking about evidence-based medicine, we're looking at a particular um, sort of focused way of dealing with what I think of as a very objective situation. The, the essence of the evidence-based medicine metaphor is you have a therapeutic problem. You have a disease state and you want to cure or fix that disease state and so you apply a systematic way of looking at evidence to come up with the right answer. And there's an objectivity to that that I think is very clear. Um, there isn't any question about what the desired end is which is your improved health. And there isn't any question about whether or not that has been achieved. So you know whether or not you have made the right decision by the relative lack of disease state. And the question to me is whether or not the types of questions and problems that we're dealing with um, in information practice have that same kind of objectivity and so are amenable to that same kind of application of the EBM metaphor. And I think this is true not necessarily just for information practice, but for all of the other domains in which um, evidence-based has become the uh, latest favorite buzzword. Um, when I look at the book, and tried to sort of get a handle on what, what this evidence-based library and information practice movement is really about. You do find things like, like this quote, um, the success of the evidence-based practice movement has resulted in a new paradigm. And that seems to me to be one of the fundamental features of this discussion, that we are talking about really something brand new, a new way of thinking about what we do that is somehow a significant break from the past which again brings me back to my concern about the practice of medicine. Um, in the introduction, uh, Booth and Bryce say that the contribution of evidence to information practice has only been recognized in recent years. Uh, again, the implication being that we are now doing something new and different and that however we based our decisions in the past, it was apparently not based on 
an interest in using evidence. On the other hand, um, Eldridge in his article also suggests that evidence-based information practice existed as a concept long before it became a label. So even within the handbook, there is some diversity of opinion in terms of is this something that is really a brand new paradigm shift, as they say. Um, I try never to use that word without sarcastic quotes. Um, or is this simply a continuation of existing practice and perhaps we're just getting better at doing what we have always intended to do? And I think you can sort of uh, look at this um, within the concept of, of the sort of common limitations that we've talked about, this comes up over and over. You ask the question, why are we not doing more with evidence-based practice? And these seem to be repeated as we don't have enough time, we don't have sufficient skills, we don't have the quality of evidence. But the, the suggestion is that if indeed these limitations were resolved and we had infinite time and we had perfect skills and we had a tremendously robust body of evidence, then indeed we would be able to answer all of the major questions facing information practice. And what I want to suggest is that that is not the case. Even if all of these limitations were resolved, there is still a significant portion of the problems and decisions facing us that simply cannot be answered solely by an application of this evidence-based practice method. Um, you can look at it uh, graphically, I suppose, uh, the alternative views. Here's the world of evidence-based practice in all of its many manifestations. And here's the domain of information practice. So all of our problems and all of our issues and all of the things we're trying to figure out are completely contained within evidence-based practice. And when those limitations are resolved, we can address everything that we need to by applying that systematic method. The alternative view would be that there is more of an intersection and that, well, the methodologies may be useful for addressing some of our issues, there are a host of important decisions and issues that simply lie outside of that and to which we have to apply other sorts of intellectual processes. Um, I'm intrigued always by the focus on asking questions. And, I, and again, I have to say it was seen uh, John Eldridge do a uh, workshop on formulating questions that was very persuasive to me and that I think um, the work that he's done in that area really does make a significant contribution. The, uh, the most comprehensive list of questions that I'm aware of uh, comes from the uh, listing that he put into Hypothesis uh, back in the spring 2001 issue where uh, a number of questions in a variety of domains across information practice had been gathered and categorized and organized. And there's been a lot of work done within the literature of evidence-based information practice um, trying to, to sort of group and cluster questions and phrase questions more clearly. Um, what I have not seen as much of, which is the obvious next step, is actually looking at the degree to which those questions are indeed amenable to answering strictly by evidence. Now, certainly some are. And it's easy to find um, lots of examples where a well-structured question is amenable to answer by some systematic process of evidence. The concern here is whether that is true for all of the questions that are in that list, for example. Um, or you can look at um, any sort of random selection of, of people's thinking. I asked my uh, staff as I was getting ready to come down here, what were some of the things that were on their minds that they worried about in terms of our future? And uh, I did not try to, to pump them with this. Uh, I told them I was doing this debate, but didn't ask them to think of questions in any particular way, but just what's on your mind. And I was interested to see what they would come up with to see if at least in my sort of limited way of thinking about it, the questions seem to me to be amenable to answering s strictly by an application of research. Again, not, not the question not being, do we have the research base available right now to answer those questions? But could it even theoretically, could there be an evidence base that would be sufficient to answer these questions? So these are some of the things that they came up with. Um, my cataloger is very concerned about the role of subject vocabularies. Um, he is concerned, as some, many catalogers are, about the Library of Congress's apparent backing off 
from uh, the rigor of developing controlled subject vocabularies. We see all this stuff about tagging going on out there and questions about what is the right approach. So this is one of the things that he's worried about. Uh, this we see all the time. Is Google a competitor? Is Google going to put us out of business? Or is Google another tool that we should simply be making use of in a variety of ways? Um, this is something that concerns me these days because there's a lot of work going on in my campus about restructuring the undergraduate library. Um, we all are faced with the issue of having to devote less space to printed collections, so what do we do with this heavy investment of uh, real estate? Um, and my deputy director is real big on all of the social networking type tools, so he wants to know what is the appropriate mix of Web 2.0 services in a library environment. So, these are the kinds of things that we start to think about in terms of our future and in terms of what we're trying to do as librarians. And as I think about those questions and I try to think about the kind of evidence that would be helpful, and clearly all of these questions can be assisted by better research, by looking for better evidence. But what I would suggest is that there is a component to these that has to do with values that has to do with who we are as library and information professionals, that has to do with how we think of our relationship to our communities, that has to do with who we really think we are moving into the future, and that these questions can't be answered simply by an appeal to evidence. Um, Dr. Hunsecker made a, uh, what I thought was a very good presentation on Monday in which he talked about the importance of theory. Um, the suggestion that you can't really interpret the evidence until you have a sufficient body of theory. And I, and I, think, I think he makes a good point. Um, here what I'm concerned with is the notion of value, ethics, um, our sense of ourselves as a profession. Um, to go back to my, my previous set of questions, the way that we apply the evidence that is available is going to have to do with who we think we are in the world and in the communities. And unless we are very clear about our sense of values, I would suggest that no amount of evidence is going to enable us to answer the questions and to know that we have the right answer. Because in most of these cases, there isn't a right answer. It's not like the disease metaphor where you have somebody who is sick and then they're well and we can all answer that. The question about Google, is Google a competitor or not? Well, yes and no. It depends on the angle that you're approaching it from. It depends on the stance that you take. And no amount of evidence is going to be able to reveal to you what the right answer to these questions is. So to sum this up, and to then give Andrew the opportunity to uh, explain why I'm all wet here, um, clearly developing a better research base learning how to evaluate the literature better, doing better studies, doing replicable studies, building a body of evidence, all of these things are very, very important. And to the extent that the evidence-based practice movement pushes us in that direction, it's a very good thing. And I certainly have no quarrel with it. But it worries me when we talk about it as a paradigm and as a break with the past and as something that can be all-encompassing and that should be the essence of our approach to all of our questions because I think to the extent that we lose the emphasis on values and the emphasis on our relation to our communities, evidence-based practice can indeed lead us into the wrong direction and from that standpoint it is clearly and simply wrong. Thank you, Denise. The microphone's come off in my hand. There we go. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Scott, for getting us off to such a good start and waking the audience up for me.
Um, I'll just remind us, um, I've purposely selected the word big because that's how Scott has chosen to phrase it, that's how Scott has chosen to approach it. Um, so we're exploring the degree to which these big questions can be handled um, by EBLIP. In other words, can we apply all the questions that concern us um, or are we limited to a, a, a narrow subset? Now, to a certain extent, I, I felt on a bit dodgy ground before I even started because I think actually we're arguing the wrong thing. There's an implication in what Scott's saying that um, is uh, mistaken. And th th that's the idea that um, what is EBLIP, what can EBLIP do for us? And EBLIP is not something that we bolt on to what we currently do. It's an approach that affects what we do. And um, uh, in Manchester Airport on the way here, I picked up my copy of The Guardian and there's the great speeches of the 20th century here. And um, after being disappointed that none of mine featured on here, um, <laughs> uh, I came up with this one that, um, I mean, The Guardian is a, an American, uh, sorry, it's a, a UK newspaper, and so uh, I'll forgive you Americans if you don't recognize this particular um, speech here. Um, but um, I'll give you a clue. It was given by a president whose name, uh, who was so famous that he's known by his initials, and it's not W. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to talk about why questions are so important to EBLIP. I'm going to spice up the debate a little bit, and then in homage to my worthy opponent, I'm going to look at some of the wonderings of um, Scott Pluchak. Um, it sounds like it's sort of one of these books that you can buy on Amazon, isn't it? Uh, maybe it will be. Um, and then start to talk, talk um, uh, practically and then really talk about some big questions because I can do big questions. Um, but here we sort of isolate the importance of asking answerable questions. It, it's important not just because it comes at the beginning of the process, it's important because a lot of the effort that we invest is determined by getting the questions right. And I think that's something that we already uh, agree with. Um, we have to get the questions right. And so I just, uh, Scott's um, already touched on this, but I'll just give you a, a few sort of edited highlights, or he might call them edited lowlights of the developments of questions. Um, really, we look before the profession to talk about questions, a, a certain recognition that, that only some of the questions that we have are focused, are about choices, are about decisions, are about alternatives. And so I'm very indebted to this early work done by Scott Richardson and, and colleagues as part of the evidence-based medicine movement. The idea that you start with foreground questions and those questions relate much more closely to the, the bigger questions that Scott's um, addressing here. And then you move to, uh, sorry, you, 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 sorry, you start with background questions. <laughs> That's a good start, isn't it? Um, you start with background questions, the ones that are, are, are of the nature that Scott uh, vividly demonstrated, and then you move to foreground questions, the ones where you're talking about decisions and choices. And the background questions, yes, can be um, sort of discussed amongst colleagues. You can canvass your staff if they're brave enough to agree or disagree with you. Um, and you can get those sort of questions, but it's only when you get to these foreground questions, when you're making choices um, between, for example, am I going to uh, deliver access to my electronic journals through a, uh, a subject-based list or through a catalogue. That is a, a clear decision, and that is what we know as a foreground question. Um, uh, Jonathan Eldridge, who's looking very um, fuzzy here, he's, he's a lot clearer in real life, um, <laughs> but uh, he very clearly focused us on the fact that questions are the starting point. Um, and uh, this was perhaps aspirational because he says that evidence-based library and information practice assigns highest priority to the questions with the greatest relevance. Uh, I, I think that's what we should do. I think it's arguable whether we've done that yet. And I'm hoping that um, the sort of discussion that Scott's initiating today will help us do that more. But that's not to rubbish the question process. It's to say, well, we need to put in some values. We've got to make some hard decisions. We've got to come to agreement on what is most important. And so um, I, I was part of this survey that uh, John did, this international survey. Um, uh, and there are some very big questions here. 
um, including the question that uh, Scott's asking, really. Does evidence-based librarianship advance all of librarianship or just those areas that are easily quantified? Um, I think the only issue I'd take with um, this uh, excellent uh, uh, resume that uh, Johnson compiled was the claim that these were the most relevant and the most answerable. I think that that's something that we've subsequently had cause to explore. And that was, uh, again, an aspiration. And there were questions that have been answered. There are a lot of questions there that haven't. There are some questions that are now out of date. And there are some questions, as Scott says, that are probably not uh, answerable um, uh, in, in terms of a mechanical approach. But that's not to say they can't be resolved by bringing in other factors. Um, and uh, one of the things that is a problem to us is that the questions that are important to you and I as practitioners are not necessarily the same questions that researchers want to answer, choose to answer, get funded to answer. But then again, that's not a problem with the paradigm that, as there you are, you can put some money in the swear box for me. I've used that dreaded word. Um, but um, it's not a problem with the paradigm, but um, it, it's a problem with uh, how we're taking it forward at the moment. Um, and again, indebted to Jonathan here with um, uh, his uh, classification of questions, um, saying that there are some questions that are intervention questions, the, the ones that uh, fit neatly within the EBLIP model. Um, but there are other questions, wider questions, prediction questions, but more importantly, exploration questions. And those are the ones that co coincide much more closely with these background questions. So we've always recognized there are big questions as well as those that submit to the the EBLIP framework comfortably. Um, I, I always have to put in a, a, a local expert to uh, try and appeal to those of you who uh, are card-carrying the University of North Carolina people, so please vote for me later, bear this in mind. Um, but here we, here we have um, a, a, a paper that um, records in a similar way to was done in evidence-based medicine that, of course, the research method you choose is determined by the question that you're trying to answer. So we're not talking about a model that is applied uh, sort of uncritically um, to every particular question. We're talking about a toolkit, a toolbox, from which we select to answer questions appropriately. And um, uh, here's um, Scott's own contribution here. Um, he's, he's sort of reducing evidence-based practice to simply what works. And one of the interesting things about this conference is that we're seeing that, that in fact, evidence-based practice is a lot broader than that. It's things like, why do things work? What do users feel about whether things work or not? What can we do with our users in order to gain their acceptance? What sort of things should we be prioritizing? Um, and that, that we do have certain problems, and I'm not going to sort of um, uh, paint over these particular um, uh, inadequacies here. Um, we're gen generally, as a profession, we're poor at exploiting our own professional literature. And we've seen good strides made with, for example, the Lister database being made uh, uh, available that enables us to find out more what, what's been done. Um, but we and we've seen this in the conference, we have enthusiasm for new technologies, so we tend to go after the more glamorous questions rather than the ones that would make a difference to our day-to-day -day practice. We're lured and seduced by the technologies. That doesn't make them the more, more important questions, it just makes them the ones that we think uh, are, are the ones to be answered now. Um, and here, um, uh, Scott's already used his word, skeptic, um, and this is really um, to sum up his uh, argument that the questions are not really amenable to the rigorous investigation that EBL calls for. Um, and here's my sort of um, latest take on things. I don't question the value of the questioning process what I question at the moment is whether we've got it right in prioritizing the topics. Um, in some cases, we may go for the more glamorous questions. In some cases, we go for the easy hits. In some cases, we go for the more reportable. That doesn't mean to say that the method itself is inadequate. Um, and uh, the final um, writing uh, uh, by Jonathan, a re recent revisiting of the whole process, um, talks a little bit more about this process of not doing it in a mechanical way. It's more about reflecting on the whole process as we go along. And I think um, if there is any shared ground between the two of us, it is this point that, that whether, whatever model you have and whatever its strengths and weaknesses, you mustn't apply a model uncritically. You must think at every stage along the process. 
Um, and uh, although Scott uh, pointed back to Jonathan Eldridge's list of questions, um, uh, uh, some colleagues of mine down in Australia, uh, Suzanne Lewis and Lisa Cotter, have recently published in the EBLIP journal a sort of questions revisited, albeit from a couple of workshops that uh, I ran down there, where we asked librarians to say, what are the questions that are commanding you? And a large proportion of those were readily adaptable to research mechanisms. Um, and we do recognize that we are different from the medical model. Um, and we do recognize that the values, to use Scott's word, of our users are important. And that is part of full evidence-based practice. The preferences of our users, they mediate the decisions we make. Um, and this is recognized in our, in our equivalent of the PICO formula used by medicine, that we don't just use population as if it's a homogenous thing that applies across every library context, that we take into account the setting of the library in which we operate and the perspective that we're trying to capture, recognizing a sort of pluralistic view of the library universe. Um, and so, for example, we could take a question like this, and we realize that this could unpick to several questions, one of which is, for example, the perspective of the staff. Um, another perspective could be the perspective of a university management, could be the perspective of the students, um, could be the perspective of those who provide the funds. So there are multiple perspectives which contribute to making bigger questions. So uh, a building block of evidence-based practice is that the best available evidence is going to be comparative. It will measure changes over time. It will clearly describe what's going on. It will measure things in clear ways and it will be in a relevant study population. Uh, so now to turn my attention, uh, uh, this is a friendly debate. I've never been part of a friendly debate before. Um, and uh, by Queensbury rules, of course, it's the, the lowest form to do is to sort of um, ad hominem attacks, isn't it, onto uh, our distinguished guests. But um, I just couldn't resist it, really. Um, <laughs> so, Pluchak in Wonderland. Um, Scott advocated us to keep our mind in curious mode. Does that word ring a bell? Curious mode. Well, we'll come to that a bit more. And then he says, it's about, you know, when you haven't got much to do in a health sciences library, you just sit there and you wonder. Um, so I wonder if my users would respond that way. And then you, then you um, say, um, well, I've got an idea. Let's um, see if we can uh, replicate the findings of this particular study in our own setting. Incidentally, I found a bit of ancestry here for the bearded pigs, as you can see in the quote here. Um, uh, this is from the, the picture. It says, if it had grown up, she said to herself, it would have made a dreadfully ugly child, but it makes a rather handsome pig, I think. <laughs> uh, and yes, we pick up in the word curious, curiouser and curiouser. We're in the curious position of trying to identify interventions without having a precise definition of the condition that we're trying to achieve. Well, there's a challenge that Scott is extending to us. We need to define what we're trying to achieve. Um, but it does have vague recollections of, of um, Humpty Dumpty here, doesn't it? When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And then Alice, of course, observes this. I'm going to observe now. The question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. And again, uh, inspiration from Alice. Um, we have a, a quote from Scott again. We can and do speak in general terms about what a good collection is. I suppose in the most ideal sense, the good collection is that for which every user's need can be met from the collection itself, and the collection has no unused materials. But Scott quite rightly contrasts that with the real world, the world that we're in when we're not falling down the rabbit hole and we haven't been uh, pursuing the white rabbit. And, and so Alice quite correctly um, uh, sort of uh, uh, attacks Scott here by saying, then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, Alice hastily replied, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing you know. Not the same thing a bit, said the Hatter. Why, you might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same as I eat what I see. So recollections there, um, uh, uh, some similarities, we know where the inspiration comes from. And what about outcomes? Well, Scott has something to do with outcomes. And, and uh, Alice in Wonderland, or Pluchak in Wonderland, the, there's a lot of um, these dis discussions, these debates that go on, um, the, these sort of dialogues. And so we've got one from Scott's uh, own context. The hospital administrator raised his hand with a question. So the standard is 70% right? 
We all nodded. We've now achieved the standard for all the libraries. More nodding. Does that mean we've done good? And so that's very similar to the uh, debate on the other side. What do you know about this business, the king said to Alice? Nothing, said Alice. Nothing whatever, persisted the king. Nothing whatever, said Alice. That's very important, the king said, turning to the jury. Unimportant, your majesty means, of course, the white rabbit interrupted in a respectful tone. Unimportant, of course, I meant, the king hastily said. So in a world where everything is relative, then we can't use evidence-based practice. When we can't agree words and meanings, then no, we can't use evidence-based practice. But that's not necessarily the word that, world that you and I inhabit. And just to conclude, we need to know where we're getting uh, to. Um, uh, as Scott correctly and, uh, uh, identifies, the difficulty of determining whether or not we have done good continues to plague us in libraries. And then here's this quote from uh, 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 the cat here that says, it doesn't matter which way you go so long as I get somewhere. Oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. So what sort of questions does Scott want answered? Well, of course, um, the, the, um, the, the book, the, the Art of War, um, says you should know your enemy. So I've been um, intellectually stalking Scott through blogs and Googles and things like that. And I came across this. This was a report of um, a, a, a conference, a, a very down-to-earth sort of practical type conference, apparently about the management of e-resources. And yet we had a contrast here. Pluchak's presentation, which inspired the attendees, as he does today, but to contemplate the larger philosophical questions related to the management of e-resources. Is that what you're doing in your libraries, you're contemplating the larger philosophical question. I must admit that if I was at that conference, I probably would have allied myself with the others who brought to light specific tools and trends to shape the future of e-resources. And I think that's what evidence-based practice is about. And then it all clicked into place because I found this welcome to Scott as he was uh, 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 became editor of the journal, the Medical Library Association, and I discovered that he's got a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy and things started to make sense to me. This parallel universe that Scott inhabits. And so it is a parallel universe. We have philosophy, a route of many roads leading from nowhere to nothing. <laughs> where science is what you know and philosophy is what you don't know. But I'm a pragmatist, a person who takes a practical approach to problems. And so I'm looking at the usefulness, the practicality, and therefore I'm a natural opponent to Scott's criticism. Um, just finally, you've had enough of Alice in Wonderland, but um, Alice in Wonderland referred to the, thing, the importance of having six impossible things before breakfast. Well, we nearly got there. We're at breakfast now, but um, this contemplation of some of the more important questions is perhaps one of those impossible things that Scott would want us to reason on. So we're talking about practicality, we're talking about pragmatism, we're not talking about um, delaying or deferring decisions until we have uh, some universal insight. And I, I'm quoting another person in the audience in a shameless attempt to get one more vote, and this is Rowena Cullen, who said that it's, it's all about managers making decisions. It's all about equipping us to make more informed decisions, to maximize the impact of library and information services. But there are challenges, and I've not skated over them. We need a bigger body of evidence. We need to do some bodybuilding, or in re reduction in some cases. Um, we need to conduct meaningful research. We need to get the problems right. We need to prioritize the questions. We need to learn how to handle uncertainty, what to do when the evidence isn't there or isn't conclusive. But most importantly, we need to tackle the core, not the marginal business. Now, that's not the same as Scott's big questions. What's core in your library? Did you know that there's research actually looking at the value of um, clerking in your journals, your paper-based journals? That is core to so many libraries still, even despite the electronic era. So we're talking not about big questions, we're talking about core questions. They don't have to be sexy or glamorous or technologically inspired. We need to make evidence-based practice part of the routine practice. But I can do big questions, and, and I was just sitting there with a notepad, and I came up with some big questions for Scott here. And unfortunately, these questions are as big now as they were first inspired in the 1960s. In fact, some of them are actually more, uh, more important now um, because of their, their political um, cu currentness here. 
But I can do big questions, but they don't belong here in evidence-based library and information practice. And if this is the sort of big question that Scott wants, then we, he knows where he can go. The answer's blowing in the wind. <laughs> but we ha we've been arguing around the margins here. The, big, the biggest issue facing us is not about finding answers. It's not even about identifying questions, although that's really important. It's about encouraging questioning. And that's what I see the real value of evidence-based practice. And hopefully on the next CD that quote will come on. Um, and this is something recognized from evidence-based practice within school librarianship. It's about best practice and reflective practice. It's about getting you to think, yes, not applying things mechanically, and that's, again, one thing that Scott and I share, the, the, the need to examine and think about um, everything that we do. And I, I've actually said that it's this that will eventually take over evidence-based practice. And that's what I hope, that we won't be talking about evidence-based practice because we'll be reflective practitioners from every angle. We'll reflect when our users say something. We'll reflect something when our prompted staff give us some nice questions. We'll reflect on why they've given us those particular questions. And so the ultimate aim is to build up a toolkit, a toolbox for practical purposes. And we need to develop this art of questioning for everything, even things that we consider sacrosanct to our profession. And I was a bit um, uh, worried about using this next analogy because I know that you're extremely fond of one and not very fond of the other in this country, but I'm going to use it anyway. We need to identify the sacred cows and we need to make them into hamburgers. And that's about our core business. And that's where I'd like to conclude. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm happy to see that we agree on so many things. Oh, I see what you did to this. Um, I also I, I like the. Uh, the um, Alice in Wonderland quotes. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of, of, the, uh, of the whole Alice in Wonderland um, looking at language and precision of language. Um, I, th I think one of the ways that I can, I can respond to some of the many and somewhat self-contradictory things that Andrew said um, by referring to a, a different sort of language problem. Many of you are familiar with the discussions going on about Library 2.0 and may be aware that I am uh, deeply opposed to the phrase Library 2.0. I always, I always have to be careful about um, that I, I don't object to many of the concepts and issues that are contained within the discussions that go by that rubric. But the more that I read among the partisans who speak to um, the importance of Library 2.0, the more trouble I have trying to figure out exactly what they mean. It seems to me that Library 2.0 has become one of these um, buzzwords that makes many people very excited but is actually an incoherent term because it attempts to cover so many different things. And there's a point at which a term can be useful in nudging one forward, but when it becomes the label for a movement or for a new paradigm or suggesting it's a new way of thinking, then I think it starts to trouble me because instead of helping us think more clearly, I think it can actually pre prevent us from thinking clearly. And as I listen to um, Andrew talking about the range of things that evidence-based library and information practice is supposed to cover, I start to have that same sort of concern. And I'm thinking, OK, if evidence-based library and information practice is a new way of a approaching what we do, and if the focus is not on a strict 
method. And it's not on finding answers. And it's not necessarily on doing the right thing. But it is to encourage us to be in a questioning mode. Although we have to be careful about the questions that we ask because we don't want to get too philosophical. <laughs> then I find myself wondering, what is it about that, that is different from what we've always done? Um, and have we, in fact, created this movement um, and in an attempt to make it something distinct, in an attempt to create it as this paradigm, we've created a false opposition between what we have done in the past and a continuum that hope, hopefully makes us do things better as if to suggest that now we're doing something completely new and different that not, has not been done before. Um, one of the great things that uh, happened while I was editor of the JMLA, n not something that I can take any credit for whatsoever, um, was that the National Library of Medicine digitized the entire run and it's now possible to go back through the whole history of the Bulletin of the Medical Library Association um, to the very beginning. And it's great because it now becomes easy to go back and really look at the core literature and health sciences librarianship for a hundred years. And if you go back into that, I think you would be hard pressed to suggest that the notion of being reflected, reflective, the notion of asking questions, the notion of connecting to users, the notion of getting better at dealing with the pragmatic issues that one faces day to day, that that is somehow any more new and special now than it was 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and 100 years ago. What I think has happened under the rubric of EBLIP is an increasing emphasis on being more systematic, on looking at the way that we create research, on looking at how we use it, that is very, very important and very useful. I just don't think it's anything new. And the danger, I think, of using a phrase is that it leads you to create this false opposition and to think that what we did in the past was somehow wrong and that what we're doing now is creating a whole new way of being professionals. And I think there is some danger and risk in that. And perhaps the danger and risk is best exemplified by Andrew's outright rejection of asking those sorts of philosophical questions that I think are fundamental to our existence as librarians and information professionals today. Um, I'm not sure he actually meant to say that we should not be thinking about who we are and we should not be thinking about our role in society and we should not be thinking about how we meet a social mission at a time when um, the world is undergoing such a tremendous change from a print-based world to one in which digital information is so important. But it sounded like he was saying we shouldn't be asking those questions. And I think at this particular point in time, while doing all of the pragmatic stuff is very important and trying to deal with whether or not we should be checking in paper-based journals, which is a great um, area, the, the importance of, of going after the sacred cows is tremendously important. Um, all of that's great, but I think now more than ever we absolutely have to ask the deep philosophical questions about who we are and what our role is, and I don't think that those have clear answers. Those are things we just have to struggle with. And if we don't, if evidence-based librarianship and information practice leads us to reject that kind of questioning, then I think it has done a disservice that is perhaps greater than the benefits that it has brought.
Well, thank you, Scott. Um, so you've all been shelling out money to attend a conference on something that uh, doesn't belong to exist. If you'd like a refund, come and see Scott personally afterwards. I mean, obviously, you're here, so you do believe that there is a need to at least think about the potential of evidence-based practice for your day-to-day -day practice. If you'd wanted philosophy, then you could have gone to a local wood and sat under a tree and meditated and taken your, put your sandals on, and I'm sure Scott would be the first to join, join you, um, and that's, that's appropriate. That has its place. Um, that place is not here. Um, and Scott said, I thought we were already doing that. I thought we could go back to the year dot in the um, Journal of the Medical Library Association or, or whatever it was called at that particular point. We, we could go back to that and we see this happening. But that's how clinicians deluded themselves. That they were, that they were doing things without really questioning why are we doing that things. Uh, an example I use in evidence-based practice why are people fasted before they go into surgery? Is it because they could choke on their, their own vomit? Who's more likely to choke on their own vomit? People surrounded by a trained medical team of six or seven people, or someone who's coming home on a Saturday night having had too much to drink? It was so that the anaesthetist didn't get his shoes dirty. And a lot of our libraries are set up for the benefits of the organization and the staff, and we tell ourselves it's what the users want. Uh, the other example I use is not, definitely not for polite company, so I'll use it with you. Um, um, it was, I get my inspiration from the, world of, uh, from the world of midwifery. The midwives were among the first to challenge what they did. And I read this article, it, it was talking about um, shaving of women before they had a baby. And this was an eye-opener for me, because I didn't know that women grew facial hair just before they had a baby. <laughs> but why were they doing it? Was it for the comfort of the user? Was it because it was clinically proven that that was a benefit? Was it for the convenience of the staff? I don't know what our equivalent in libraries is for um, that sort of shaving, <laughs> and I'm willing to hear suggestions later on. Um, but I, I did come across some, uh, so, some work recently from Nottingham University where it showed that the perceptions of the users were, were quite different from the deluded perceptions of the staff. And so we need to question, we need to focus on what we can do effectively. Um, according to Scott's analogy, he was resisting the idea of um, applying the medical model and I, I think I've just discovered that EBLIP is a disease and I need treatment. Um, it's a bit like in West Side Story when they say I'm a social disease. Yes, by being here in EBLIP you're all a social disease and uh, Scott will be wheeling out the antibiotics if he had his way. And uh, he almost got lyrical with his philosoph philosophy stroke poetry telling us that if we had world enough and time, I don't think Andrew Marvel actually would have done evidence-based practice. I think he was going to spend some time with his coy mistress. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I can't understand that. I, I chose to go to the uh, North Carolina uh, campus rather than to go to the mall, so maybe I would have uh, done, spent my time as Scott did there. Um, and, and he used Boolean logic. Trust a philosopher to use Boolean logic. Eh? He was talking about, could it solely answer those questions? Does he not know about A, not B? What a load of Boolean. <laughs> but did you notice, in conclusion, uh, that a lot of the words, the questions that, that Scott had, had words in that were value-laden, like appropriate, or there were things to do with opinion, or they were about the meaning of good. Yes, those are things that we're going to continue to wrestle with, as we've been wrestling with since the beginning of the Bulletin of the Medical Library Association. Those won't go away. But we could spend all our time just trying to wrestle with those, or we could be doing, as we're doing at this conference, trying to address questions that make a practical difference for ourselves, for our staff, and for our users. And I think that's the best use of our time. Thank you. So now I'd like to hear from all of you.
Carol, fast off the mark. <laughs> Do you have a question or a comment? Insights 
perhaps made in other contexts that you need to interpret. So um, I, I think the, the assumption that we're sort of drawing a line under history and we're saying anything before uh, EBLIP uh, is valueless and anything subsequent is of value is not borne out by the actual methods we use to build up our knowledge base. I'd like to hear some more from the floor, back here. Uh, I'm perplexed by, by Mr. Booth's comments because the, the question he um, refers to, I was introduced to in 1973. The Association of Research Libraries, the broad scope movement, has always done evidence-based research. If you look at the history of library automation, if you look at what we went through to implement AACR2, we never gave it a name because that was part and part of what we did. And I've done every day of my career. So it's a new name for it. But I think you're almost violating your own rules if you don't go back and look at what we have. And maybe it's just a matter of the British Commonwealth catching up with uh, <laughs> my brain. That's my take on it. We've been doing it for probably half a century. So I don't understand. I came here to um, learn, and I have learned some things. But the main thing I've come away with is that we've been doing this thing all along. And I'm really perplexed that you've ignored uh, that much of our uh, American library. Maybe it is a um, there's a cultural thing. There's a supply of tea bags ready to be dropped in the bathroom if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, that, is that when you have to resort to Alice in Wonderland and humor, that means you stop thinking. So I'd like to hear some ideas and some real sense from you. I haven't said a thing yet. I feel like I'm watching uh, The Daily Show with this British um, commentator. I'd like to hear some real ideas and, and recognize that we have been doing this for decades. Well, again, I apologize for my Britishness, but um, <laughs> now it's all good. Yes, it's and good. I think that we're going to have to get some other opinions, and perhaps the two of you will have to talk afterwards. <laughs> yes, so here. is the diversity of opinion. So we may personally agree or not agree. We learn from being diverse. I have, uh, I'm disappointed for a different reason about this conference. I think we have been doing a lot of evidence-based uh, uh, decision-making all along. It's the core of the profession. I do appreciate what Andrew said about questioning more. However, I have not heard a lot about moving from evidence-based findings to innovation. If we keep going back to say, this is the data we find, this is perhaps where we should go. Putting it in practice, making decisions is only step one. It's so rudimentary. It's what we humans ought to do. But we would never have had a car if we asked, what would you like? Patron, the user will say, I want a stronger horse. I want a faster horse. How did we develop a car? Who told us we wanted an iPod and have you know iPod so successful? When should I move as a profession from finding historical data and then putting it in innovation? Whether you view Google, Amazon, or Netflix as competitor or not, they are good examples for our profession to be innovative, one step ahead of user, innovative companies. We should not just search literature to see what worked, what might be yet another process improvement. We want some innovation, and that's how we, as a profession, would survive. I would like to hear how you would use these uh, evidence-based, make the profession leap a bit more than just finding data that would make minimal improvement. Do you want to just briefly comment on that? I think it's a big conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, would, I would like to say that uh, one of the challenges that I extended at the beginning of this conference was examples of getting evidence into practice that I was very keen. This wasn't just another example of a research conference and just presenting research. I, I, I share sort of similar observations that we've heard a lot about good research going on. I certainly am not either intending to rubbish research that's going on now or research that's going on past, um, there is something that we bring to the mix that is not re re uh, reducible to methodologies. Um, it is that flash of insight, it is that flash of, of, of innovation. Um, I welcome that. I think it takes 
the ability to both synthesize what you've already got, to look at where you are, and to sort of mediate that through your own professional expertise. And so I would fully support everything that you've just said. Other thoughts?
pragmatic is how I am doing my service useful, so I have a job now. So anyway, I just thought that's what I've gotten out of this conference the most on this debate. Thank you. Others? Virginia? Um, Scott, I wanted to be persuaded by your argument because I really like theory and that kind of slide, but I have an MA in English, so I give me theory. Um, but you lost me when you said right answer because maybe it's the postmodernist in me, but there are many right answers, and I think that it necessarily has to be filtered through um, individual librarians or libraries, values, and context. And so to, to say the right answer, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just wait. No, if I can, um, I try to be clear. I, I think that that was hardly my point. I, I think that for many of these things, there is not a right answer. Um, and to me, one of the limitations of what I see in the literature about evidence-based practice is the suggestion that somehow, by applying this method systematically, you will indeed come up with the right answer. And, and since I don't believe that in many cases there is a right answer, that to me is part of the danger that what I see in the literature of evidence-based practice is that it doesn't necessarily leave sufficient room for exactly the point of but I, I think two in the literature, and I believe it might be from one of Jonathan's papers, I can't, I can't remember, but the, the idea that it is filtered through the individual context. And I don't necessarily think that the overarching thing is suggesting that there is that one right answer. Thank you. Yes? I want to resist the temptation to point out uh, the obvious that uh, pragmatism is also philosophy. It's a branch of philosophy. <laughs> 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 that's, that's that only is a branch of philosophy. It, it is like neo pragmatism, uh, typically American, the greatest American contribution to uh, philosophy, I should think. It's normally called that in the case. But I'm not going to do all of that. That's not <laughs> <laughs> here, here, my, my uh, background as a classicist comes in, uh, imitating Cicero, as it were. But I want to point out that uh, one of the uh, most telling indictments at least philosophically telling, of evidence-based evidence medicine is there, that there has never been a bit of evidence produced to show to the standards that are maintained by evidence-based medicine that applying PBM has ever led to better health care for the patient. This is repeatedly pointed out, and it's even admitted by those who are the original advocates of uh, PBM. Uh, my question is, is it possible to show to the standards of evidence which we uh, uh, ourselves uh, uh, advocate that evidence-based library integration practice has ever led to better library integration practice for the purposes of those we're trying to serve and whose work we're trying to uh, facilitate? I don't think we're even close to that yet. Oh, okay. I, I don't know, do, you, do the debaters agree? Well, I, I suspect that we do agree on that point. And, and again, the question is, is, is it a matter that we haven't gotten there yet? Or that the goal is not achievable fundamentally? And we won't really know that, I think, until we go further down this road. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just like to say, I'm not sure why we've got the importance of uh, evaluating what is basically a process when what's, what we do have evidence is, you look at the Cochrane li Library, the Cochrane Collaboration logo, evidence there that lives can be saved by, by the results of part of the evidence-based practice process of producing systematic reviews. Now that isn't an evaluation of evidence-based practice, but it is an outcome from applying the practice. And I would argue the same applies, uh, as Denise says, we haven't formally sat down and thought, let's evaluate evidence-based library and information practice, but valuable pieces of work, systematic reviews, have been produced that are making a difference. And if we want to deflect from the outcomes of those valuable pieces of work and spend all our time navel-gazing about the evidence-based practice process itself, then, then that's a choice that we have to make. It's not one that I would personally want to do. I think we can take about five more minutes for the audience. 
Yes, Glenda? Um, I'm not a philosophy major, but I did study it in my undergraduate curriculum, and I'm well aware of the fact that this is a false logical premise, but the clearest memory that I have of what I learned in philosophy was the Aristotelian false premise argument that a cat is a quadruped, a dog is a quadruped, therefore a cat is a dog. <laughs> and I would like to suggest to this audience um, and to both speakers that perhaps what we are really arguing here is not for or against. It's simply a matter, I think both Andrew and Scott are correct, and I'm quoting one of my users, um, who is a medical practitioner, who said to me, what the evidence does for us is to create a healthy dose of skepticemia. <laughs> the important fact is that we are asking the questions, whether they're the big value questions or whether they're the smaller questions that lead to an improvement in immediate practice. I think the questioning is what is so important about the evidence-based practice, rather than who is right and who is wrong. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, for one, really welcome uh, evidence-based practice. I think it's evolutionary and it's systematic. One of my literary mentors that I've been reading over the last few years and is teaching me this said that case studies are a mark of a, of a young discipline. And in my particular research specialty, I have a plethora of, of case studies, which is why I've chosen to do reviews. Uh, the work of evidence-based research that will take this discussion team down to the next, forward to the next path. And I think that's where its value comes in. And that's where our evolution in this research field uh, is going to take us. I have one half point left. And that is that cars are measured in horsepower. <laughs> <laughs>
And I applaud Scott for saying that doesn't answer the big question about who we are or what we're for, but I think if we don't have information like this to advocate for our profession and for our libraries, we may not be around to ask who are we and what are we for because we may be doing One last thing, one last question or comment, and then I'll turn it back over. Yes, here in the front. I am um, for evidence-based practice, and I think it has its place, and it's very important in libraries. I am in an academic setting, though, and as I think about uh, our impending loss of librarians uh, due to retirement over years to come, and our efforts right now to attract PhD holders outside of LIS in the hum humanities area, or I think of librarians like myself, I do two, um, two, I'm involved in two areas of research, those of us doing more esoteric or historical research, where, I, where does that fit in? It doesn't really. So I, I think that there was a young lady on the other side of the table that it's really important that we look at it as important to certain aspects of librarianship and not all, because it can't possibly apply in the same way for other types of research that is important to librarianship as well. Thank you. And I'm just thinking as you're speaking that maybe, I don't know if it can fit in or not, that's a good question, And but um, yeah, you know, for you to take what you're doing and see if it can and put that out there and start that kind of discussion, make us think about some of the structure and, things that we've already put in place, those things can still change. So in any case, thank you for this lively discussion. Um, I think it's really added to our, our uh, debate here today. But I would like to give our debaters one minute each, or less, please, <laughs> to just a closing statement, the one key point that they would like to leave you all with. And then um, I think we'll take a show of hands to see where we all stand on this issue. So, um, Scott. Um, I find that I agree with most of the comments that have been made. Of course, one of the things that's challenging about doing this kind of debate is I, I think we're both pushed into taking somewhat extreme views in order to uh, highlight some of the issues. Uh, but it, again, I, I think for me, the notion, I, I like what was just said about you know, evidence-based librarianship, it's, it's a tool. It's a method. It has tremendous value. It's tremendously useful. But I also agree, it's, we've been doing this kind of stuff all along. And so to the extent that the literature and discussions of evidence-based librarianship encourage us to do better what we have always done and to be more systematic about what we've always done and to be more evaluative and to be more user-focused, all of those things, then it's useful to the extent that it leads us to think that we are making a break from the past and doing something new, or to the extent that it pushes us away from answering the big questions or discussing the big questions at the same time that we're being pragmatic, then I think that there is a risk and a danger to us. Thank you. Andrew? Well, I knew putting the word friendly into a debate was a mistake, but um, Scott and I have been friendly throughout, and as Scott says, we share an awful lot in common, and uh, uh, so it's really for you to decide now. Uh, I have to say that as far as the debate goes, that Scott's completely won me over. <laughs> I, I have become a philosopher, and the answer for philosophers is, it depends. <laughs> and so I'd like you to listen very carefully to how I would phrase the resolution that you're being asked to vote on. If you believe that evidence-based library information practice can answer these little inconsequential but very practical, very day-to-day -day questions that you're trying to get answers to, then of course vote for my side, vote no. If Scott has convinced you of the importance of philosophy and its approach, then don't answer yes, don't answer no, vote, it depends. <laughs> I think I'm more confused than ever. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so our resolution is that the big questions that face our profession cannot be structured in such a way as to meet the test of evidence-based library information practice. How many of you agree with this statement um, as, and side with Scott? Oh boy, I think we're going to have to count. It's going to come out very even here. And okay, uh, how many of you are against and agree with Andrew? And those undecided think that this is all a bunch of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all.